Good morning. Thank you to the conference um, organizers. I appreciate the opportunity to present to you. And I think that this um, topic follows nicely from the previous two because it's uh, intimately related to uh, how we think about and how we extend value in oncology. So I'm gonna speak about real world data. When and how is it valid to use? Oh, let's see if I can get the slides to go. These are um, my disclosures. So uh, a brief outline is I'm gonna discuss some of the genesis and reasons for intense current interest in real world data and real world evidence, present uh, an overview of some of the use cases, some of the challenges, and expanding capacity for real world data and real world evidence um, use to accelerate progress. So I'm gonna present a US centric um, view and uh, my apologies to the European. We have different problems in our system. So we just heard about some of the challenges in the Italian system where some patients, for example, do not yet have access to immunotherapy despite the fact that there's evidence that it is, can be quite effective. In our system, we have fewer problems with access but we have lots of waste. And even though there's the potential for access, uh, still we have problems with equity and not all patients who can benefit from treatments actually receive them. So in the United States, our Congress passed something in 2016 known as the 21st Century Cure Act passed by our Congress after intensive lobbying, both from patient advocacy organizations and the pharmaceutical industry. This act focused on improving access to medicines and accelerating research, including but not specific to oncology. The act required the FDA to establish a program to systematically evaluate real world evidence to support the approval of new indications for drug approvals under a particular section of the FDA law. The goal was to support and satisfy post-approval study requirements and to make fulfilling those requirements, which consume a lot of pharmaceutical company budgets, much easier. The FDA released a draft framework with guidance for industry in December 2018, which is posted on their website and contains a wealth of useful detail. So some definitions of real world data and real world evidence from the FDA draft guidance. And I would uh, note that the European Medic, uh, that the EMA has a very similar uh, related um, draft materials on its website. Real world data is defined as data relating to any aspect of a patient's health status that are collected in the context of routine healthcare delivery. And those data may come from a variety of sources, including billing claims and encounter records, population level registries. For example, some countries have national healthcare systems and collect biometric data on all 18 year old, 18 year olds at the time of military conscription or maintain other national population level registries, particularly the Nordic countries. There are also disease specific and device registries, particularly relevant for cancer where most countries have tumor registries. Importantly, there are electronic health records. Increasingly, we have patient reported data from surveys and the abundance of apps that are now proliferating. We also have electronic surveillance data that may come from activity trackers, various implants and wear wearables. And we also have data from large pragmatic clinical trials, cluster randomized trials, or even natural experiments, such as the introduction of new drugs into different countries at different time points. Most frequently, however, real world data is defined by what it's not, data from prospective well-controlled randomized trials. The purpose of real world data is to generate real world evidence that we can use in the clinic to make good decisions. So everyone's well aware of the challenges in development of effective cancer medicines. Drug development is lengthy and failure rates are high. Thus the interest 
in using real world data to accelerate the process. There's immense public demand around the world for accelerated progress in oncology. And the problems with the traditional drug development paradigm are well recognized. Too few participants mean that randomized controlled trial results have high internal validity, but often lack external validity and do not generalize to typical patients, as the previous speaker so nicely described. In the United States, we still have a problem with very few of our patients actually participating in clinical trials. We need to do a better job leveraging real-world data to, dis to, to promote discovery, and this requires data integration. In the U.S., we've had a tremendous investment over the past decade in generating reams and reams of genomic data, sequencing patients, particularly those with metastatic disease. We can describe patients' genomic features, and we know what features, what molecular features their tumors express. We need to integrate that with therapeutic data, which treatments they receive, and relate that to the outcomes data that describe which genomic features associated with which therapeutic, date, therapeutic interventions go on to achieve the very best results. To learn from the 95% of patients who never receive treatment on a clinical trial, we need to focus much more intensively on strengthening the real-world data ecosystem, which is stunning in its complexity. So here's 80405, the trial referred to, the CLGB trial uh, referred, to, referred to by Dr. Sobrero. So this trial took nearly a decade from conception to reporting. Look at those survival curves, nearly identical. It took a long time, it required many patients, and it had issues, as previously noted, with external validity. But what did it fail to do? There's potential that small subsets might have derived differential benefit from the two common treatment regimens. But this trial uh, could not detect this. How could we learn more and accelerate progress in our real world data? The answer. I like this cartoon. Tumor biology reveals heterogeneity, but treatment in oncology largely remains one size fits all. Even though we can molecularly characterize patients, MSI being but one example, we still too often do not base our treatment on leveraging those important insights. So clearly, a major motivation for real-world data and real-world evidence development is the growth and dissemination of precision medicine. There are other factors that enable the use of real-world data and real-world evidence. In particular, the growth and dissemination of electronic health records in the United States and around the world. Increasingly, international data standards exist that facilitate meaningful data sharing and allow us to make international comparisons. In addition, the massive growth in computational power with fast computers that enable diverse data sets to be easily linked, and the declining costs for data storage create tremendous opportunity to leverage and use data that previously went unexamined. So what are some of the use cases for real-world data and real-world evidence mm -hmm. in oncology? I think most simply they can be divided into two main categories in the life cycle of oncology drugs. First, to support drug development, testing, and regulatory approval. This use case is relatively new, there are relatively few examples, and it remains highly controversial. Second is after a drug has received regulatory approval from the FDA, EMA, or other authority. This is quite standard, has gone on for decades, and the number of use cases are rapidly expanding as the depth, breadth, and quality of the data that exists improves. So what are use cases for real-world data in oncology drug development in the post-drug approval space? First, to meet post-marketing commitments, often referred to as phase four trials, to perform necessary pharmacovigilance to detect um, adverse events and toxicity, 
to identify exceptional subgroups, those patients who have exceptionally deep or long-lasting response, or those patients who don't seem to get any benefit whatsoever, to monitor dissemination, who's actually getting the drugs once they're approved, to measure the efficacy effectiveness gap and public health impact, that gap, known as the implementation gap, is the difference between how well a drug performs under ideal conditions compared to how well it performs when it's used in everyday treatment contexts. And finally, to expand drug labels to new, previously untested indications. So what about post-marketing commitments? Traditionally, those commitments are often not met. This is expensive for industry. The studies often have low scientific yields. They're conducted in select accessible populations. And they tend to capture pre-specified outcomes on case report forms. A real-world data approach would use standardized EHR metrics to evaluate treatment experience for all drug recipients, and hopefully would do so more expeditiously. The goal is to capture outcomes that can be extracted and gleaned reliably from the EHR. Things like dosing, dose modifications, major lab toxicity, things that can be easily measured like emergency department or emergency department visits or hospitalizations. Things that can be measured consistently include the time from starting a drug, first dose of a drug in, to last dose of a drug administered to a patient, overall survival. It is very challenging to measure response to treatments and um, outcomes like disease-free survival and progression-free survival. With respect to pharmacovigilance, the traditional approach relies on voluntary reports from users that are difficult to sift through and inconsistently submitted to regulatory authorities. We rely on firms to meet their post-marketing commitments in a timely fashion and to report these data, and they include very minimal reports made directly from patients themselves. A real-world data approach would use standardized EHRs to interrogate lab data for all users and measure standardized outcomes, including dose delays, dose reduction, and really emphasize patient-reported outcomes, which are becoming inexpensive, quick, and easy to collect. And our patients are happy uh, to support our efforts in this regard. What about real-world data for identification of distinctive subgroups? The traditional approach is to perform post hoc extensive analysis of RCT patient data subsequent dr to drug approval to identify those exceptional responders or those with exceptional resistance to, and to focus on select subgroups from the phase four trials conducted at select study sites. A real world data approach would again interrogate EHRs combined with routinely performed molecular profiles, linking them to those that are performed by the growing number of uh, companies that perform these profiles to figure out the very small molecular subsets who are deriving particular benefit or lack of benefit. This has resulted in a number of creative and strategic data partnerships. For example, Foundation Medicine and Flatiron Health have linked their genomic data and their electron electronic health record data curation efforts in a recent successful effort to accomplish this in lung cancer. What about real-world data for label expansion? Traditionally, new drug labeling indications require new clinical trials that demonstrate benefit. And many of these trials in niche populations are never performed, leaving us docs left to extrapolate and make decisions at the bedside to the extent permissible by regulatory authorities. Decisions get made, but knowledge is not captured in future cases. So I practice in Boston, and our regulatory authorities are pretty loose and sloppy. So I don't have a hard time giving drugs that are FDA approved for colorectal cancer to my patients with appendix cancer and duodenal cancer. But I have patients who drive down from Montreal four hours to the north with those same cancers, and their regulatory authorities are quite different, and uh, those patients do not have access to those drugs. A real-world data approach would capture off-label use and measure outcomes in a consistent fashion from EHR data and use the data to expand or contract the label. 
and then use the, the, the information to dictate coverage and or reimbursement levels. So a couple of use cases. The FDA expanded the palbocyclib label to include men with HER2 positive ER negative breast cancer in 2019, but recognized there are only 2,700 cases of male breast cancer each year in the US, and conducting RCTs would have been extremely challenging. Paloma 2 and Paloma 3, the foundational trials that led to approval, excluded men. I think we might go, at, go back and ask why this decision was made in the first place. To obtain this label extension, expansion, multiple real-world data sources were integrated. This included data from a company-sponsored registry, electronic health record data from Flatiron, and insurance claims also from a commercial vendor. What about use cases in the pre-approval space? Opportunities here include identifying importance in clinical need, selecting optimal sites to conduct a study, informing study design, clinical trial execution, by simplifying case report forms, de decreasing the burden of data collection, and facilitating interoperability across study sites. But what's controversial is to, to support applications for accelerated approval based on uncontrolled studies and avoid the need for randomization by using synthetic control arms that are formed from real world data. And this is where things get dicey and controversial. A label expansion example in the pre-approval space. Blinitumumab received approval for Philadelphia chromosome negative relapsed and refractory B cell ALL based on a single small phase two trial. The results were compared with historical data from nearly 700 comparable patients extracted from EHRs. Real world data was also used to support approval of avolumab for treatment of metastatic Merkel cell. Again, the phase two data demonstrated significant and durable response. Real world data describing outcomes in historical cohorts of patients were included in the regulatory drug application. But this was an ideal use case for real world data because it was a very rare cancer with no previous effective treatment, a very clear strong signal from phase two, very homogeneous treatment in real world data, and a clear reproducible endpoint. This is a situation that is unlikely to prevail in most other situations, particularly in many of the common GI cancers, such as colorectal and pancreas. Use of real world data to avoid the need for randomization. I think we will see this only in the rarest of cases. It is extremely yeah. challenging to we use. We have to come to an end, please. What? Yeah. It is extremely challenging to use synthetic controls for common cancers. Validity traps abound, and it's unlikely to be acceptable to regulators absent very strong signal. Observational data simply cannot control for confounding by unmeasured factors, and trials with endpoints other than survival are especially challenging. Therefore, I would conclude that randomized trials will remain the backbone of progress, and the strategies to improve their execution must be prioritized. No Thank you.